Coming up on Bobcat Breakdown, we have all you need to know about Quinnipiac men's ice hockey team's big wins this past week. Plus, the Quinnipiac women's basketball team had a strong weekend on the road. Bobcat Breakdown starts right now. Good evening and welcome to this week's edition of Bobcat Breakdown. I'm your host, Brooke Riley, and I'm pretty excited to be hosting my first Q30 sports show ever. Alongside me are Jack Main and Brian Schwartz on the desk. How are we doing tonight, guys? I'm doing great, Brian. How are you doing? Pretty awesome, Jack. Happy to be on Brooke's first show. And I, and I hope that everybody has fun tonight. Yeah, me too. I'm happy to have you guys here with me. The Quinnipiac men's ice hockey team had a victorious weekend back in Hamden. Now guys, this year they beat Cornell, and last year they won against UMass Amherst, which are both number one teams in the country. Brian, what do you think QU has done that's been so effective in taking down the number one team in the country back-to-back -back years? Brooke, when I look at this Quinnipiac men's ice hockey team and these two big wins against number one teams this year and last year, I look at two things. I look at one, the penalties. Quinnipiac only had three penalties in those two games combined, and Limiting those penalties, especially with such a young team like they have this year, is absolutely crucial. The discipline on this team is outstanding, and they, they really showed that in that game Friday night. So that was huge. That's number one. Number two for me is the coming out of the gate hot. This Quinnipiac team came out of the gate hot in both of these games. Wyatt Bon Giovanni scored, in, scored 42 seconds into the game last year. Nick Germain scored twice. Zach Metza both scored in the first 12 minutes in this year's game. So getting that early lead, getting the advantage. And look, both games were home. They got the home crowd into it right away. They did, they did. They played very disciplined hockey, and that's why they were able to get those two big wins. And, and I have to agree with you. You know, getting off to the fast start is something that is extremely important in hockey. You know, uh, I know in, in most sports, you know, it's extremely important that when you score first, your chan your, your statistic statistically, your chances of winning shoot up like a, like a madman. So um, the team has been living through this offense, but the defense has been stepping up huge. Odin Tufto on the offensive side is tied for the ECAC lead with 29 points and leads the ECAC with 26 assists. And Bon Giovanni is tied for second in the ECAC with 13 goals. I mean, those are offensive numbers that you just cannot ignore. Petrozelli has been outstanding. He's fourth in ECAC with 582 saves. He's fifth in goals against uh, with uh, uh, 2.13 goals allowed per game. I, I, you know, you would love to see him uh, lower those numbers just a little bit. His only two shutouts this year are come against Vermont and against Cornell on Friday night. But the big win against Cornell, I think that that really sets the tone for this team uh, for the rest of the season. You look at that video that's on the screen right now. I mean, look at that crowd against UMass. Look at the Teletubbies, look at the student section. It is packed. That is the type of crowd that is going to get into it if you yeah. get on the board early. And that's what they did in these two games, and that's why they really had this success. Absolutely. Now, Petrozelli has played in every game this season. Are you worried they put all their eggs in one basket, Jack? And do you think there's any chance of burnout? Absolutely not. I mean, after you shut out the number one team in the country, are you really going to want to switch goalies? Cornell is number two in ECAC in goals per game at 3.29, 3 and how many did Keith let by? Zero. Cornell is number two in the power play in ECAC, and how many did Keith let by? Zero. Cornell has scored 69 goals this season. How many did Keith let by on Friday night? I'm going to guess zero. Zero. Yeah. I mean, you are not going to go with anybody else on th this season because this team is comfortable right now with, with Petrozelli in, in goal. Uh, we've, we've seen it time and time again. His growth from sitting behind Shortridge last year to this year taking over that starting role, he has been outstanding for the Bobcats. He played like a brick wall on Friday night. I got to sit behind him for two periods, and I was, I'm watching him be athletic, and I'm watching him make glove saves, diving saves, saves above his head. He was just just electric to watch. The team was behind him. The bench was behind him. The Teletubbies, the spirit group, all the fans were behind him. And that is exactly what fueled Quinnipiac to a 5 nothing win against the number one team in the country. Yeah, there is absolutely no reason to sit Keith Petra's alley, Jack. There is literally no reason. You talk about burnout. The guy's 20 years old. He turns 21 actually this weekend. Yeah. What 21-year-old gets tired from playing two hockey games a week? Yeah, all right, a little bit. But you're not taking him out. This guy is playing at, at one of the highest levels of goalkeeping in the, in the nation. So why would you take him out? 
I, I really don't know why you would, and, and I think that, you know, with, with, with the Bobcats right now, they have two goalies that are kind of waiting to take those reins after Petrozelli leaves and, and moves on. But as of right now, you know, I just don't understand why anyone would consider even taking Petrozelli out. But, um, you know, just he's done an outstanding job uh, in, in goal this season for the Bobcats. Every year, Quinnipiac men's ice hockey team does pretty well in rankings nationally, but through extreme highs and lows, what's the true destiny for this season's team? Brooke, when I look at this team this year, I don't see Frozen Four or a national championship, but what I do see is that they can get a first round bye in the ECAC tournament this upcoming month. They have a pretty weak schedule the rest of the year. You, you look at the schedule and there are a bunch of winnable games throughout the rest of this season. This team can definitely get that first round by. They can cruise into the playoffs. And look, if they cruise into the playoffs and get a bunch of wins here, and we're talking they're in, in the NCAA tournament, uh, yeah, they're not going to go far in the NCAA tournament, but they could definitely make the NCAA tournament. I think maybe similar to what they did last year is something is somewhat reachable for them this season. Uh, yeah, and I and I agree. You know, a slow start to the season kind of kind of uh, derailed the momentum that any any kind of momentum that they had from last season. Uh, and coming in here, you know, we you know we we lose Chase Prisky, we lose Shortridge, but in his place we get a great season from Bon Giovanni, Tufto, and uh, and Pe and Petrozelli in in that place. And I think that the that the ceiling for this team right now is they can win the ECAC tournament. And I think that if, as long as they stay hot at the right time, taking down the number one team in the country is huge, and then uh, taking down Colgate in, in back to back games, I think that's huge for them as well. If they can continue this momentum and they can continue to play strong to their strengths, which is elite offense, and as long as they score you know, more goals than their opponent, which I know that sounds super ridiculous, mm -hmm. you would do that anyway, but you know, as long as they can continue to uh, put up high number of shots on goal, eventually those goals will fall, score more points than the other team, and that's how you win games. I think you got to worry about, though, is the inconsistency. Consistency. We saw the big lineup changes this weekend, and yeah, they worked, but are they going to really work in the long run? We don't know. So that's something right. that they have to make sure they're consistent with, and it could be tinkering around with the lineup, because look, that happens to almost any team, but through the long haul for the rest of this season, they've got to be consistent. Yeah, and if there's one thing that I think the Bobcats could do is that I think that they could do things a little better defensively. You shouldn't have to beat Holy Cross 4-3, to three, and you shouldn't beat Colgate by by just one goal. You should be romping Colgate, especially if you beat the number one team 5 nothing, and you should be romping Holy Cross, a team that isn't nationally ranked as well. So uh, I think that stepping things up a little bit defensively would uh, would definitely help these Bobcats move forward. And now enough men's ice hockey for now, but let's stay on the rink and move over to the women's ice hockey team. The women's team had two three to two wins or three to one wins, sorry, against Brown and Yale this weekend. Also, Brian, so after three straight losses to top ten teams, how does the sweep on the road set the tone for the rest of the season? I don't know how much it sets the tone for the rest of the season. They beat a team in Brown who's at the bottom of the ECAC. They're not very good. And they beat a team in Yale who's a pretty solid team. Not obviously top tier in the ECAC, but yeah, it's nice to get a couple of wins here. But I, I don't think it sets the tone. Yes, they do have to keep winning games to really make moves in the conference. And their schedule the rest of the season isn't all that difficult. The toughest team they're going to play is probably Clarkson, who... You know they're beatable for this team. So, uh, as as setting setting the tone, yeah, it's nice to get two wins. Are they going to go undefeated the rest of the season? <clears throat> no. Are they going to fly into the ECAC playoffs and win that and sweep the whole thing? Absolutely not. But it is too nice to get two wins, get back on the right groove, and right. here they are. And if you think that these that this weekend sweep between Yale and Brown sets the tone positively for the rest of the season, I say no. And here comes my inner baseball stat geek self out because of the teams ahead of the Bobcats in the ECAC, Cornell, Princeton, Harvard, Clarkson, Yale, and Colgate, they are 4-6-1, and one, and they have been outscored 23-19. to 19. That's just a four-goal difference, and three of those six losses have been by one score. So you have to try to turn those six losses, at least take four of them and put them into the win column. And, and, and and in that case, what you do then is you can you move up drastically in the standings, and that then sets the tone for the rest of the season saying, hey, yeah, we can beat those teams that are ahead of us that we have to play in the playoffs and later here down the home stretch of the season. So uh, and if sweeping you know, Brown and Yale, I really don't see that as anything special for this team, which is uber talented. They just got to figure out how to put it all together in the coming weeks. Now, like you said, Jack, clearly this team is quite talented, but I want to know who your top three most valuable players are. Jack, take it away. Well, here's my hot take. 
Abby Ives is not in my top three, okay. and I'll explain why. Zoe Boyd is the quarterback of this defense. And yeah, I know you're looking at me and you're like, holy, holy cow, Jack really just said that. And yes, I did. Zoe Boyd is one of the best off-puck skaters at this school. I promise you. She sets, she sets her teammates up so well. She does not make errant passes, and she always controls the puck before running with it, which means that she doesn't turn the puck over, and that doesn't cause you know opportunities for the other team. My, uh, my other one is Katie Taven. She's the team motivator. She grinds every play. She wears the C on her chest for a reason. She had two points versus Brown this past week. She flies under the radar. She gets the job done. 29 blocks and 11 points. Very multi-purpose. And then the, my last MVP of this team is Lexi Agia, the spark plug sophomore from, from Canada. She is the most talented skater on this team. Uh, she leaves the team with 23 points. She's got two game-winning goals this year. She takes penalties pretty frequently. She's second on the team in penalties. But as long as she keeps, as long as she kind of like takes that role and, and and makes up for it with that, with the good skating and with the with the moves that 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 she can make on the ice, that dukes out defenders and that kind of thing. You know, she can take this team all the way to the playoffs. Hope maybe even get a couple playoff wins, and you know, just maybe there's that outside hope of getting uh, of getting a, a couple wins in this playoff. Let me ask you this: How is Abby Ives not in your top three MVPs for this team? I just seems like I, such an obvious and, answer. But it's, 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 just, it's not to it's not to say anything bad about those three that you picked. Obviously, they're terrific players, huge part of the team, very valuable. Like, yeah. How do you not have Abby Ives? On I just, top three? I just feel like that's too obvious. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, that doesn't you, matter if it's if obvious. You put, if you put your goalie on every single top three, that that basically means that two players are the MVP of the team. It was is, was okay. So let's, let's go to the NFL quarterback. Isn't that the obvious MVP? Well, yes, but if they you look, every I'm, year. I'm talking, cares? I'm talking about. We're talking a, about at the what makes the quarterback what makes the quarterback good? You have a good offensive line, a good running okay, back, but and a good receiving. Offensive line game. isn't winning the MVP. He's not winning the MVP, and yes, it's the quarterback that's distributing the ball. But that's exactly why I have Zoe Boyd. I have it right here in my notes. Yeah, she I is see the it. Quarterback of the defense. That, that's, she helps this team win games. That's great, but she's not Abby Ives. I, I, she Abby may not be Abby Ives, but she helps direct the traffic, man. I am telling you, she is. The best defender that this team has, one of the best defenders that this team has, and the best off-puck skater. We talk about it in basketball, off-ball screens, off-ball movement. Who's the best at doing that in the NBA? Zoe Boyd is the best at doing that on the hockey rink. That's great. Abby Ives is by far the MVP of this hey, team. Hey, I wanted to put her in. I'm telling you, I wanted to put so her in. So put her in a two or three. To, to ha not have her at one. Okay, fine. I got to have, I gotta have <laughs> Zoe Boyd in there. I'm sorry. Three. I got to have her and Taven in. I got Abby Ives, uh, Prater, and Agia. My top three, bro. Well, guys, you keep debating this on the commercial break if you want, but don't go anywhere because when we come back, we're bringing it to the court to talk some hoops. Stay with us. Touchdown! Oh, you see that? Whoa, 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 we scored? Yeah, we scored. We're going to the playoffs. I can't believe I missed that. Every time I'm buzzed, I spend too much time on my phone. What? I should take your phone away. No, no, no. I'll call for a ride. Hey, why does my face look like that? <laughs> I'm, I'm playing with these new face uh, filters. Okay, you know what? what? Yep, that's mine. I'm gonna need that back. No. Nope. Kevin! I'm Jenny Garth, and as a mother of three, I know kids worry about a lot of things. Getting enough food to eat shouldn't be one of them. But here in America, that is a real worry for one in five children. This is unacceptable, and something Feeding America is working to solve. Through a nationwide network of food banks, Feeding America serves virtually every community in the United States, including yours. 
See how you can help your community. Visit feedingamerica.org. Together, we can solve hunger. Together, we're Feeding America. And we are back, and we're taking it to the hardwood this time. Quinnipiac men's basketball team split the weekend, defeating Canisius and losing to Niagara. Now, these guys had a pretty, pretty good first half of the season, but how do you guys think the second half of the season is going to go? Jack, what are your thoughts? Well, I think that the Bobcats are going to go 8-3 and three for the rest of the season, and it's going to be a grind. This team was built for a good run. They have talent on both ends of the court, uh, and they're just one game back from Monmouth, who sits in first place right now, uh, and, and the Bobcats ride in third right now. So I think that right now, as long as the Bobcats can win their big games and win games on the road, which has been their biggest struggle this year, they're 3-6 and six away from the puck, they can, you know, they, they do have a chance at, at and really this could be a top three team battle here with, uh, with um with St. Peter's and and Monmouth. So I, I think the Bobcats could go eight and three the rest of the way. Yeah. Eight and three, sure. I I don't see them dominating the second half of the schedule just because of the parity in the Mac so far this year. You look at teams like Monmouth and Manhattan and Quinnipiac and Ryder <clears> and Siena, and that's naming five teams already, and those are at the top echelon of this conference. Sure. And then there's that next tier of the St. Peter's, the Niagara, the Fairfield, Caduceus. And you could even throw Iona in there. I think Maris is the only one that we are really, that we're really able to count them out. The rest of them, you're not able to count any of these teams out. And you look at Iona, who's sitting there in last place. If they made a run in March in the MAC tournament uh, down in Atlantic City, it wouldn't surprise any of us. So I think this Quinnipiac team will be about the same, maybe around that six and four number that they had so far in this first half of the max season. I don't think they're going to dominate. I don't think they're going to be really bad. I think they're going to be somewhat in the middle. They'll lose some of these games. They have two against Iona. I wouldn't be surprised if they dropped one of those. Uh, you got another game against Manhattan. At St. Peter's will be a tough game. At Ryder, those are back-to-back, -back, St. Peter's and Ryder, down in New Jersey. Those two will be tough. I wouldn't be surprised if they drop one or maybe both of those games. Um, you know, to lose another game against Siena. They have Monmouth again. These are some really good teams that could definitely beat Quinnipiac. Absolutely. And some say that Kevin Mafro is a key player for the men's basketball team. But, Brian, I want to know just how big you think he's been for this team's 6-4 and four start. He's almost as big in this team sense as he is size-wise compared to the other players in this conference. Kevin Marfo has been an absolute stud for this Quinnipiac Bobcats team, and they wouldn't be in the position that they're in without Marfo's play so far this season. You look at what he could do on the offensive end. He's a presence down low. He helps out the other players uh, with the pick and roll and the screen game, and then getting down low, he finishes really well. And then you look at the defensive end. This guy's the top rebounder in the nation. He is. The top rebounder in the nation. 13.6 rebounds per game. That's .4 more over John Mooney from Notre Dame. He's got 13.2. This guy's averaging a double-double. There's nothing not to like about Kevin Marfo's game, except that he can't shoot the three, which basically everybody else on this team can, which is okay. But what Kevin Marfo has done so far you cannot take that for granted if you're Quinnipiac, and they're definitely not, and they need him to keep this up. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't agree more with you. Kevin Marfo is my team MVP, averaging a double-double, leading the nation in, re in rebounds. Richie 1K got some votes, but Kevin leads the nation in rebounds, as you mentioned. And and when you, what happens when you get rebounds? You get possessions. And when you do with your possessions, you score points. And when you score more points than the other team, Brian, you win games. So if Kevin Marfo's play on the other end of the court can help the Bobcats on offense, and he still does, he produces uh, he produces from under underneath the basket, and he shoots very well from the stripe as well. So uh, as long as he continues this top play, and yeah, we know he plays in the MAC, which means he doesn't play against the best of the best in the country. But even when he went down to Miami, he still pulled down 13 rebounds. So you know there is a there is you know he he could he could definitely play with the best of the best in this country, and it's going to come back here in my final roar later tonight. Looking forward to it. <laughs> Now we all know the big names on the team that everyone looks out for, but there's always some players that may fall under the radar to fans. So Jack, outside of the big names, who do you think is an under the radar valuable piece that might get overlooked? Well, Pickney is the guy for me. I mean, he has been absolutely outstanding coming onto this team. He's 
He seems like if you need a light to be changed in your room, you call this guy because he is one of the tallest guys in in uh, in the MAC. It seems like he's uh, averaging 3.1 points per game, 3.3 rebounds per game, and he's shooting 72% from the field. So yeah, maybe he's not putting up the big numbers that Kevin Marfo is, but he is the guy that the Bobcats can go to off the bench. He seems like he doesn't even need to jump to hit the rim uh, for for an alley oop. So he has been the absolute underdog uh, value piece for this team off the bench. Yeah. Uh, to me, with Pinkney, it's just he's a little inconsistent. I'm going with Brendan McGuire, who was inserted into the starting lineup a few weeks ago. And, and even though the numbers aren't there, you can see what he does in the game. He really lengthens their rotation a bit with him in the starting lineup. Now they have Aaron Falzone coming off the bench. You've got a bench of Falzone, Blanc, Pinkron, and Pinkney. That's four key role players that really lengthens this team out. McGuire being in the starting lineup and meshing really well with Rich Kelly and Tyrese Williams in the backcourt, that helps this team a lot. I think what McGuire has done since he started to get big minutes and be in this starting lineup, uh, you can't take that for granted at all. He's been outstanding. He passes the ball really well for a big guard. When he came to Quinnipiac, I thought he was going to be more of a forward, kind of more in that three-ish type role of the lineup, but he's kind of played the two guard and he's played it really well. And the Quinnipiac women's basketball team is also off to a successful start this year, especially with their sweeps this past weekend against St. Peter's and Iona. Basketball season is about halfway over, so you guys have seen these ladies play for a good chunk of time. What's been the most surprising to you or something you didn't expect about this team? Go ahead, Brian. I don't know about surprising, and I wouldn't call this surprising because we could kind of see it developing last year, but I'm going with Paige Warfel's development into what could potentially be an all-MAC first-team player this season. Offensively and defensively, she's got a ton of double-doubles so far this year. Again, it's not really a surprise. You could see the talent was there. She's averaging 10 more minutes per game from last year to this year. She went from 5.5 points per game to 8.5 points per game, 5.2 rebounds per game to 10.3 rebounds per game this season. She's really played well, and she's been an anchor on that offense for the Bobcats and the defense, for that matter, playing the forward spot. You see right there, the blocks are outstanding. Her and Michaela Morris have really played well together in the starting lineup down low, and that's helped the Bobcats. That's helped a lot of the guard play, too, with Shaq Edwards, Taylor Hurd, uh, and Mackenzie DeWeese in the backcourt. Yeah, and, and you know you mentioned her at the end there, and it was Michaela Moore. She is my surprise for this team. Uh, she is my vote for the MAC Rookie of the Year. She's going to get the MAC Rookie Block record. She has 17 on the season so far. She shoots 41% from the field. She turns the ball over a fair bit, but that seems to be a theme of this team um, so far this season. Um, and she averages nine, six, and eight as a first year. I mean, these are just numbers that you would expect to see from from uh, from a Paige Warfell or from a from a Shaq Edwards uh, that 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 gets regular minutes and gets regular starts. So uh, if I would, if, you know, if there's anybody on this team that has been, you know, the spark plug off the bench, it's her. I mean, you see right there, she can even drill a three when she's open. So, you know, that's not something that you always get from your, from your, uh, from the players that are, that are designed to play under the, under the board. But, you know, she is doing a great job this season. She's come in, she's, she's lit the fire under herself and she has played to the, to really her best potential. And I think that she can continue to get better as she uh, progresses here at the queue. She was one of the best players in the state of Ohio coming out of high school. So, I, again, I wouldn't even say this was a surprise, really. Maybe it's a surprise for her first season with the Bobcats, but to play at this level, I mean, Trisha Fabry had to at, may, not even expect it, had to hope that she was going to play like this and step into this role. It's been outstanding to step into this role a, in her first yeah. season with the Bobcats. And with Warfell graduating later, you, right. know, you do have that person in place to kind of take over for her. And if Warfell averages a double-double, then we have Michaela Morris who can add eight assists to right. that, to that double double, you know, hey, hey, you might have a first some, team all player. Well, you, know, you need to find someone to put in their spot next. Hey, yeah, year. exactly. Yeah, so clearly there's a lot of good players on this team, but two that seem to always stand out are Taylor Hurd and Shaq Edwards. So, Jack, if you could choose only one for the team, who would you rather build around? Brooke, I'm not going to lie to you. I struggled with this question very hard, and I really cannot pick. They both bring different qualities to the court. 
Uh, you know, Taylor Hurd, she's kind of your, your Clay Thompson who kind of uh, sh uh, shoots the three uh, and she waits for her opportunity. She's not ball dominant. Shaq Edwards is ball dominant. She is a shoot first point guard, even though she does lead the team in assists as well. Uh, the only thing um, that the only thing that I see is a problem with the guards this, this year is that they lead the team in turnovers. Uh, Shaq Edwards and DeWeese lead the team in turnovers and they need to be better at handling the rock. I get it, they're shorter players. They can't really, you know, see very well around the court around them. But uh, as long as they can control the ball and, and as long as Taylor Hurd is more aggressive and more assertive with her touches like she was in the last two games, I think that this team could really be unstoppable and really make a run at this MAC tournament. Yeah, I don't know who I would rather build around because especially for a team like this, you build around the team. And that's what Trisha Fabry has done for the last few years here, and I'm sure for her whole career, you build around the team. But I, if I had to choose one of the two, I would probably go with Shaq Edwards because of her dynamic play, what she could do with the ball, off the ball. She could shoot, she could pass. She's a, a fantastic ball handler, um, where Taylor Hurd is more of a spot-up shooter in that sense. So I think I would probably go with Shaq Edwards here, but Taylor Hurd is a huge part of this yeah. team too, and they would not be where they're at right now or in the past years without Hurd. So Edwards and Hurd both play an essential role on this team. They need both of them and to be at the, playing at their highest level and both are, success. And both are averaging career highs in just about every offensive right, category yeah. right now. So you really, it, it, like you said, it's kind of a draw. You know, I, I can't really decide as well, so... Nice winding down, guys, and so is our show. But before we go, we must take a quick commercial break, so stay with us to hear our final roars. <laughs> yeah! Sam, Elmo! Oh, hey, Julia! Are you ready to play band with us? I'm gonna play my clarinet. And Elmo's gonna play his drum! Drum loud. Oh, well, you know what to do, Julia. Hi, Julia knows. Mm -hmm. With Julia's autism, loud sounds can be too much. But she still loves to make music. <laughs> Play band. Early screening for autism can make a lifetime of difference. Find out more at screenforautism.org. One in three adults has prediabetes. One in three. That means it could be you, your favorite brother, your other brother, you, yes. your football buddy, your football buddy, you, the boss, the boss's boss. If one in three adults has prediabetes, that means it could be you, your barber, your barber's barber. Nice work. Thanks. Thanks. You. Well, it's officially that time of the night for Bobcat Breakdown. We have our final roars for you. Jack, take it away. This is going to sound kind of crazy. It might sound irrational, but here it is. The men's basketball team will make it to the NCAA tournament and win a March Madness game in the near future. The Bobcats have improved in each of the last four seasons in MAC play. They have the pieces in place this year to win the MAC. They sit third in the conference, and they're only one game behind Monmouth for the MAC league. It seems crazy, it might not come true, but March Madness was built for upsets. Growing up watching UVM play, I remember the Catamounts as a 13 seed in 2005, upset number five Syracuse in the first round in 2008. In 2018, UMBC became the first number 16 seed to upset a one seed. In that very same year, Loyola Chicago, an 11 seed, made it all the way to the final four. It's not outrageous to think the Bobcats will win a March Madness game. And it may not be this year or the year after, but it will happen. And it will happen sooner than we think. Being a good team is fun. So fun that after a conference championship, an NCAA tournament appearance that included beating a top team in the country in their own house, and even getting some National Division I preseason poll votes, the Quinnipiac Bobcats baseball team gets to come home to Hamden to play at a glorified middle school field for the next season. As we get just a few weeks away from the start of baseball, this good team deserves to play in a more fun place. The dugouts aren't the most state of the art. There's a big hill in deep right field. How about the seating for the fans where the bleachers look so uncomfortable, the player's family has set up shop down the left field line in beach chairs. The facilities that Quinnipiac has for its baseball team are just not fair, especially now that John Delaney's squad has proven they are yet another Bobcats program 
destined for another successful year. I'm not asking for the university to build Yankee Stadium Junior in Hamden, but a step up from what they have now would be nice and well deserved. Remember, great facilities bring stronger recruits, a better place to play and practice for the team itself, and probably even a few new fans. This so-called university of the future is just another step. Athletics are important, this team deserves it, and this should be the next facility to get a nice makeover. Well guys, for my final roar, we're going to toss it back to the Quinnipiac men's ice hockey team for a little. This team is clearly one to watch. They beat the number one team in the country, Cornell, on Friday night, and then Colgate again on Saturday night. That was a strong comeback after the loss to Sacred Heart in the Connecticut Ice Championship game last weekend. If there's one thing I have to say about this team, it's they feed off of their fans and the students coming out to support them. The student section was packed both nights this past weekend, and I think that really influences how they play. This weekend, the team is on the road, but they won't be too far away down the street at rival Yale's campus in New Haven. This month, they're spending every other weekend in Hamden, but now that it's February, the most anticipated game for students is coming up on Leap Day this year, and that's the home game against Yale. I'm excited to see how these guys play this weekend against them and wonder if they'll foreshadow the game that they have in a few weeks. Unfortunately, that is all the time we have for this week's episode of Bobcat Breakdown, but be sure to stay up to date with all things Quinnipiac Sports on Facebook and Twitter at Q30Sports and all of our content on Q30TV.com. For Brian Schwartz, Jack Main, the producers, and everyone behind the scenes, I'm Brooke Riley. Good night.